Um, so good morning. Yes, it's good morning still. Um, this is very echoey. It's very disconcerting. But never mind. Um, okay, now the projectors stop working. So my name's Ross Gardler. Um, I am here to talk about cloud-based VMs and building community. Um, so I've been involved with open source for a, a very long time, uh, for as long as I've been working in the IT industry. Um, I've been involved mostly around Apache projects, engaged with Apache projects. Um, I don't write a lot of code. I used to, many years ago I write, used to write code, but these days I don't write a lot of code. I do a lot of, around building communities uh, around open source projects. Um, and a year ago I moved to an organization called Microsoft Open Technologies. Um, just a show of hands, how many people have heard of Microsoft? No surprise, everybody. Microsoft Open Technologies. Okay, great. Every time I ask a question, the percentage goes up. So uh, that's good. Um, Microsoft Open Technology is a wholly owned subsidiary of Microsoft. And what we do is we, we're, we're a much more agile unit. We're not tied to any products inside of Microsoft. And so we can move at a pace that the open source world moves at. And we engage with open source projects. We contribute code to open source projects. We help people understand how to create interoperability between their open source and Microsoft products, etc. We also do standards work. Uh, and my role within the company is as a technology evangelist. So I'm here today, I'm using our branded slides, um, but I promise you, you are not gonna get a sales pitch. I've spent long enough in the open source world to know that a sales pitch is gonna go down very, very badly. So no sales pitches. I am gonna offer you some free stuff, but no sales pitches. Um, so, we need to build communities. How many people in here are committers on a, an open source project somewhere? Okay. And the rest of you are part of a community within the, uh, know, at least one open source project. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. So we all understand the value of, of community. Um, open source isn't, isn't just about a license. It isn't just about sharing code. It's about sharing the development, especially the way we do things here at, uh, at Apache. It's about benefiting from the expertise that you don't have in your own organization. It's about the many eyes principle. It's about... Um, uh, sharing code, sharing tests, et cetera, et cetera. It's about improving the quality of the software. And if you don't build a community, you don't get those benefits. So that's what we need to do. And we at Apache are pretty good at doing this. Many other people are good at it in other organizations as well. Um, but we tend to look at it as a social problem, okay? Um, we, we have people like myself who go out there and talk at conferences and tell people about this wonderful problem, that wonderful project, uh, and what they could use it for and what they engage with. What I'm going to talk about today is different from what I normally talk about. I'm going to talk about a technical thing we can do that can aid the process of building projects. And in the process, we can make our projects better as well from a, from a project management, project development point of view. So I'm going to talk about some stages of computer community engagement. And we could, we, you know, like any time you, you try to put labels on particular roles, we could put all sorts of labels up here. We could say there's many different stages than I have on this slide. But for the purposes of this presentation, these are the stages I want to focus on. So we have passerbys. People who are just passing by, they're thinking, oh, maybe this is an important project. Maybe it's good for me. They're asking questions like, just what is this project? And might it fit my needs? And our job as community builders is to attract those people and give them the information as quickly as possible. Next, we have people who say, OK, that sounds like it fits. Let's see if it really fits. And they start evaluating. So they ask much more specific questions. Can it do this? They have a specific use case. And they want to not just ask the question, but prove that it will actually work in their environment in a proof of concept uh, kind of way. If they go to the next stage, they go to using. And this is where they're actually rolling it out in use somewhere. Next stage is contributing. Hey, I found a bug while I was doing this. Here's a patch. Or here's a tutorial that explains how to apply it to this use case. Or many potential valuable contributions. And then finally, we have people who make regular contributions becoming committers. So what I'm going to talk about is how can we use virtual machines and cloud-based hosting of virtual machines to ease the transition between each of those steps. And um, one thing that I nearly always say when I start talking, but I didn't today, is I like to engage 
with people who are here and have conversations around the room. So if I say anything that you think is incorrect, stupid, whatever, I've been involved in open source long enough to know that you people probably know way more about what I'm talking about than I do and how it could be applied and how it could be tweaked from what I'm saying. So please do interrupt, correct, ask questions, ask for clarifications. If we get a conversation going around there and I don't get through my slides, that's going to be beneficial to all of us. So don't worry about me standing up here. There's a man at the back who's going to tell me when we're running out of time and I'll start winding it up at that point. Okay. So what we have to do is we have to make it worthwhile for people taking the next step. Okay? We can't force people into taking the next step to the next stage. We need to make it worthwhile. And to do this, we need to look at the kinds of people that will come by our, pro our project. And my mind's gone completely blank. Who's the MySQL guy, the original MySQL? Mon Monty... Sorry? Is that right? Sorry? Yeah, we'll just call him Monty. I I'm not sure what it is. You may well be right. I'm, I'm gone blank. But Monty, uh, I think it was Monty, and I haven't credited him here because I didn't have time to look it up, but I'm pretty sure he once said that there are two types of people in the community around MySQL. Cash rich, time poor, and time rich, cash poor. Now, from a community project perspective, the people who are cash poor but time rich are very valuable to us because they have time, and they have things that they can offer with that time. The people who are cash rich but time poor are indirectly valuable to us. They're not going to come in and give us direct contributions, but they may well pay somebody else to make contributions through whatever business model that somebody else has. So in this situation where we're looking at how we can bring people into the project as members of the community, I'm looking at the cash poor time rich. Um, so we want to bring direct value into the, into the project, and we need to make it as easy as possible for those people to come into the project and, and, uh, and progress through each of those stages. So the first thing we need to do is grab the interest of the passerby. And you could say, oh, well, you, you need a good website that explains what the project is and the use cases it's commonly used in, etc. You need evangelists going to conferences, etc., etc. And all those things work. But we can make it easier. Many projects provide an online demo of what, what, of what the code looks like. So we're going to look at how we can use VMs to do that, virtual machines in the cloud. The next stage is the user stage. Now, the problem with demos online is everybody is going to the same demo, and they can't really do that much with it because you've got to keep it up and running and useful for everybody else, so you're not giving full privileges to everybody. So what we then want to do is enable these people who want to evaluate to fire up their own instance so that they can do anything they want to that instance and try it out in their specific use case. The next stage is to then say to those users, well, you can now use this image to go into production and take that image straight into production, making it easier every step of the way. But we ultimately, as project, community projects, we want to bring people in to contribute. And people using binaries, virtual machine images, with binary distributions on them, have to go through hoops to get the source code, figure out how that's all, all done, find the test environment, configure their work environment, et cetera, et cetera. So can we use ways of creating, when we're creating those images, can we also create a development environment which will allow those people who are using it to move to the next stage of contributing? So I'm going to go to a demo now. And this is a, it's a screencast recording. I do that for two reasons. One, the demo gods can't break things. And two, I don't have to worry about typing the right thing. Actually, three reasons. The third reason is there's some parts of what I do in this which are slow. And I can edit that bit out and move forward. Um, so. Yeah. Could have sworn I had this queued up. And I don't know how to do that. Hang on one moment. I don't know where I put it. <laughs> Probably in here. There we go. 
Um, I use a tool called Adobe Captivate to do this. Very useful tool for doing these kind of demos if anybody cares. Um, okay, so it's showing on here. Okay. Let me put this on duplicate so I can actually control it here. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to look at the, each of those individual stages. And we're going to, um, we're going to uh, look at, there we go. We're going to look at, first of all, what a passerby typically will do. And they will come to the website, as we talked about earlier on, and they'll take a look at, at the website and say, oh, this looks interesting, the feature set looks good. How do I get to the next stage? And eventually they'll find a tutorial link on the web page. I picked Apache Solar for two, two reasons. The first is the first two projects that I tried to do this with, the installation instructions didn't work for me. And the second reason, if I could just pause that for a moment. The second reason is that um, they actually have a very well defined uh, process for getting started. And it's actually quite simple. You install JDK and then you install a binary and off you go. Okay? But even in a very simple environment like that that's well documented and works, you still have to install those dependencies, download things, configure things. You have to find a machine that you're able to do that on, etc. So there's a barrier to people actually trying this out. So what we're going to do in the next part of the video, I'm using Microsoft Azure here, uh, but of course it could be any cloud platform. It doesn't have to be Microsoft Azure. Um, is we're going to start off and we're going to as a member of the community, create a VM. So we're going we're gonna to go in uh, and we're going to create, in this case, an Ubuntu image because that was the recommended one in the tutorial. We're going to fire up an Ubuntu image in, um, in Azure. This is using the web portal. This is the current version of the portal. There's a new one coming which is uh, even easier to use, but even so, this is just a four-step process. In this case, we're not doing it for a production environment. We're not really going to put it live, so I'm not using SSH. I'm skipping out a few steps to, to, to make it easy. I'm just doing username and password. And once this is done, we'll have a base install of Linux, and we'll then SSH into that install, and we'll configure Solar on the machine. You don't need to see the, the, uh, the, this whole process. It takes about two minutes to go through the whole process and then another couple of minutes for the VM to actually spin up. Um, so now we're, we're logging into the, into the virtual machine. You can see muscle memory said there, said it was apache.org. That's what I would be doing if I was trying to type it and speak at the same time. And we'll do the configuration steps. Now, even with a document like, so, with a project like Solar, they say install OpenJDK, but they don't tell you how to install OpenJDK, which might seem obvious to most people in this room, but to passers-by, we want to make it as easy as possible. They don't necessarily know that they need to do sudo, uh, a sudo apt get update, sudo apt get install OpenJDK, et cetera. They don't necessarily know that they can do wget, as I'm doing here, to download the binaries, to unpack the binaries and install them. So this all takes a few minutes as, as, a, as a developer and we'll start the thing running through SSH. And then, of course, we now have a cloud-based application which people can go to and have a look at. So that's great. But it costs money to do this. I offer, promise to offer you free stuff. Um, you have a number of options. As an Apache project, you have two options. You could come to uh, the foundation and say, we want to run a VM for demo purposes. It's going to cost so much a year, and the board will consider that in the budget and potentially give you the money. For a small amount of money, the answer will always be yes, nearly always be yes. Second option if you're an Apache committer is Microsoft give free MSDN subscriptions to Apache committers, which includes $200 a month of Azure time. So it won't cost you anything as an Apache project to, to host this. The third option, if you don't have either of those two options to you, is to use a trial, uh, which you can get $200 free trial. That's the sales pitch. It's not really a sales pitch, it's free stuff. You can also go to Amazon, you can also go to Backspace, you can also go to wherever you want uh, where, where to, to host these things and provide the easy passerby experience of what Solar does. Oh yes, it indexes documents, isn't this great? We can, we can potentially use this, but we now need to move on to the next phase. And the next phase is, um, is to create an image that people can reuse personally. So this is a thing called VM Depot. 
Um, this is a community managed repository of virtual machines for open source projects, freely redistributable projects. Microsoft Open Technologies run this. We provide the infrastructure and we pay the hosting costs for, for the images that are on here. Um, but we don't put any images up there. I'm just going to pause that for a moment. We don't put any images up there ourselves. It's up to you as, as community people to put images up there. There's over a 1,000 images on there at the moment. Um, they're all of various flavors of Linux at this point. Um, I didn't pause that, but I shall pause it and tell you what, what happened. Um, there's no cost involved with hosting your images up there. And what people can do from that, uh, well, actually, I'll come to what they can do once I've told you what happened there. What happened there is you SSH'd into the image that we created previously. And we did a thing called deprovisioning, which removes things like SSH keys and passwords and, and various data that, that might be private, et cetera, and put some hooks in place so that Azure can fire up a, a customized image for individual people. Once it's up there, which is what's, what's happening here, they, they, the, the, the user is creating um, a, um, a, what's called a blob, of, uh, which has the VHD in it, the image in it. In a moment, you're going to make that public, and then you can upload it to VM Depot. At that point, you can delete your own blob, and you're incurring no costs whatsoever. So what does the user do? I'm going to make this, this presentation of the, the, the full demo available if people want to try it out. The full steps are in here. Um, so what the user can then do is they can go to VM Depot, um, and there's two ways of deploying it from VM Depot. They can do it through the portal, like we did with creating the Ubuntu image. But instead of finding Ubuntu, they'd go and find the Apache Foo image and fire that up. Okay. Uh, the other way they can do it is we provide Node.js uh, 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 command line tools, which enable you to deploy it from the command line. So all well and good. We can now get users experimenting with their own image with nothing more than an SSH client and a web browser. Okay, they can use Node.js if they prefer not to use the web browser. Still need the SSH client to get in there. And you give them the documentation about how to add your own content, in this case to Solar, how to add your own content, how to search it, maybe how to add Nutch as a web crawler on top of it, et cetera. So that's great. We've now got something for the passers-by, and we've got something for the users. But what we haven't got is any benefit to the developers. How do we get people contributing and engaging more directly with the project? How many people are familiar with Vagrant? About half the room. Vagrant is an excellent, excellent tool that somebody first told me about a year ago at ApacheCon and uh, I grabbed it and thought this is fantastic. What Vagrant does is it provides a way of describing a virtual machine and firing it up, bringing it down and, and using it as a development environment. So that's what we're going to do. In this case, I'm using Hyper-V, but out the box, Vagrant supports both Hyper-V and VirtualBox. Um, so I'm doing it on a Windows host here, but it could be any host. It works on Mac, it works on Linux, et cetera. Um, all I'm doing here, and I'll skip over it in a moment, is making Hyper-V is, in, is enabled on my box uh, and installing, in my case, Git for Windows, because I'm, despite the fact I work for Microsoft now, I'm actually much more comfortable in Bash and using those kinds of tools. So I put Git for Windows because that gives me open SSH, gives me Git to, to do version control, which you'll see later. I'm sure this audience doesn't need to know how to click buttons to install stuff. So now what we want to do is exactly the same steps that we did earlier, but without having to click through lots of wizards in a, in a, a, a browser in a reproducible way. So we're doing Vagrant init, and we're using this image HashiCorp Precise 64, which is an Ubuntu image. We're bringing it up as in starting it, and we're logging in to our SMB folder. That went quite quick. So we did Vagrant init, which creates a file called Vagrant file, which describes the virtual, the, 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 uh, the box, the virtual machine. And then we did, um, and then we did uh, Vagrant up, which fired up the virtual machine on our host. So I've now got Linux running on a Windows host. And it could be Linux on Mac, it could be Linux on Linux, it could be Windows on Mac, et cetera, any combination you want. What I'm showing here is one of the really powerful things about Vagrant. You have a shared folder between the host environment and the, um, and the guest environment. So what I've done is I've, I've logged into the Linux machine, and I've created a demo.txt file, and then logged out, and there it is on my host. 
Now, this seems like, well, that's obvious. Anybody can do a shared folder. There's nothing impressive about that. The impressive thing, or the important thing, is that this means that your developers can now work in their preferred host environment and work in the same production environment, development environment, for the code. So if they're on a Mac and they prefer Mac toolchain, they can do that and use their normal Mac toolchain. But they're confident in that when they actually run the application, they're running it in the same environment as every other developer. And that's really important. How many times have we had bugs that appear on your machine but not on your machine? You're removing that, it works on my machine type problem by doing this. Go ahead. No, not at this point, no. So, um, so the, 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 if it, people didn't hear the question, it's, is the image that we put into VM Depot for public consumption, is that the same as the one that we're creating Vagrant? No, but it will be by the end of this presentation. <laughs> at the moment, what we did is we manually created a virtual machine image using the Azure portal and, and SSH, com manually configured that, uh, and then put that into VM Depot. What we're now doing is saying, well, we don't want to do that manually every time we do a release and we need to update this. So we're automating it using, in this case, Vagrant. There are other tools that could do this as well, but it, I'm using Vagrant in this case. And then later we'll say, I, I will say, if I don't forget to repeat it, that you can, once you've done this, you can then upload these into VM Depot. No, no, because that's just a binary blob. Okay, and what we're doing here is we're saying, well, we want to configure it manually, and, you, and you'll see in a moment all those configuration steps that we took um, is going to be done automatically by this system. So it, think of this as source code. Think of this as the virtual machine image as source code, um, rather than as a big binary blob. Um, so, uh, so we have this shared directory, and we now have a common work environment, but we don't currently have Oh, I'm, I'm just going to do version control here, which reinforces the point of um, think of it as code. Because we can version control this, we can manage this configuration just like we manage any other software in an open source community. So we can share the expertise that we have for managing this definition. Um, but now we want to install Solar on it. We want to make it the same as it was before. Vagrant has many ways of doing this. It, it works well with Puppet, it works well with Chef, with Salt, with Ansible, with all of the common tools for configuration management. In this case, for simplicity's sake, I'm using uh, Bash, which of course is not the optimal solution, but it works and it's good for a demo like this. And I'm, all I'm doing is creating a script that does all of the things that I did manually earlier. Okay, it's exactly the same, with the one difference that comes up here is I'm saying if you haven't already got the distribution, then download it. That's the only difference between the two. There's an if statement in it to make it a little bit more efficient. Um, but other than that, it's just automating the steps that we did manually earlier on. Whoops. And then what we can do is say to Vagrant, so it's just last stage is just starting up Vagrant. Um, then what we can do is save that as a file. And here we're, we're in the Vagrant file that I mentioned earlier on, which is the configuration that Vagrant init did. And all we're doing here is we're adding a line that says, when you provision this, Use the script bootstrap.sh, which is the one that we just wrote a moment ago. Okay? So now, when we start the virtual machine using Vagrant, which is what's happening here, um, you can't see that on this screen, but the, you can see the download uh, output coming by, um, is it's, it does that configuration for us. We're grabbing the IP number for that virtual machine. We go and put it into a browser, and we'll see exactly the same thing that we saw before, but this time, we didn't have to type any commands other than Vagrant up. So now we're in this situation. So uh, there's the proof for you that it's the same thing that we looked at earlier on. Now we're in this situation where passers-by have got something useful, users have got something useful, and people moving towards uh, wanting to configure their own systems and become uh, developers are, uh, have something useful. But what about those developers? Developers don't want to work with the latest release. They want to work with the latest control, version control code. So we're going to edit the script that we had a moment ago. And instead of downloading a binary blob, we're going to check it out from subversion. So 
the version in the case of solar, it could be Git, it could be whatever version control is happening. And so all we're doing is we're saying, okay, if you don't have the current version of trunk ready, then check it out. And if you do have the current version, or you have a version, then make sure it's the current version by doing SVN update. And then the rest of it is the same as before. Um, you'll see in a moment there's a couple of additional um, requirements. So we'll do an apt get install subversion, apt get install um, uh, ant, which is the build system used here. So now people don't even know how to, don't even need to know how to get to the source code. They don't have to go hunting through the documentation to find the source code repository. They just run Vagrant up and they have the source code locally. So that's good. Now we've got access for, the, uh, for everybody up to the contributor level. And we're just showing it being provisioned again, and this will go past very quickly. In fact, I edited it out to make it quicker. Um, but in a moment, we'll go and show the version that is now running. You'll see that it's a, a, a snapshot of version 5.0 because it's checked out the version control for us. Now, of course, this is all scripted or managed by Puppet or whatever. So you can have an interactive install there saying, do you want the latest release? Do you want the latest version control? You know, you can do anything you want. You, can, um, you can, don't have to have single virtual machine images like this. You can have multiple virtual machine images. Nutch is a good partner to Solar. It's a web crawler. Why not have a virtual machine image that has Nutch installed as well, have another one that's just the base Solar thing? Why not have um, a load balanced version of Solar on the system? Why not have tests built in that simulate network failures? You can go as far as you like with this and, and fire up as many different VMs, either on your local machine, as we were just doing there, or because we're using Hyper-V in this case, you can push them out to the cloud. But that same set of scripts that you're using could be used to push them to AWS. You don't have to use Hyper-V and go to Azure. You can use any of the hypervisors and push them to any of the clouds because we're using tools like Vagrant and Puppet and Chef which focus on interoperability. So what have we managed to achieve? We've managed to achieve to mess up this projection. Um, we, have, we have managed to make it, I forgot to tell you what the end goal was, but I think we figured it out now, but you can't see it. Next time I'll embed the video in the slides and we won't have this problem. Come on. Um, so what, we, what we've done here is we've made it better for our... Hmm. All right, I'll do this. The text is going to be smaller, but hey, it's just Word. What, what we've done here is um, we've made it easier for each of those stages, but in the process of making it for each of those, uh, to progress through each of those stages, we've also improved the development process within the, the project itself. We've provided a consistent development environment for the developers to use. So it's much easier for people to get up and running quickly and easily. Uh, and most importantly, it can all be managed in version control because these tools are all just based on configuration files which are text. There's no binary blobs involved here. So that means that if you want to use Azure, you can. If you want to use AWS, you can. If you want to use Rackspace, you can. If you want to use Mac to develop, you can. If you want to use Linux to develop, you can. If you want to deploy to Windows on Linux, you can. You know, all these options are available because these powerful tools that we're now leveraging to initially build community and attract attention to your project, but also to bring benefit to your, uh, your development community as a whole. Um, so we skip over that. And I've already 
talked about that. That's, a, that's about the various different processes that we've got. We've created the standard development environment. And I've, I've already mentioned things like being able to create different configurations of this, but you can create different configurations for your users, look at the different common use cases, and provide different configurations that get them started quickly, and different configurations for your developers. So put a continuous integration system on the same VM so that you know that things are being, every time somebody makes a local change, things are being tested locally, and the user is being notified of any changes. Um, you can make sure that these things all connect to the outside world and do, low, uh, do testing against common data sets, common setups, et cetera. Et cetera. There's no um, real limit to what you can do with these things. Um, well, there's some technical limits, of course, but from as far as the imagination is concerned, there's no real limit. So what are the real benefits here? We started off saying that there's cash-rich, time-poor, and time-rich, cash-poor. And we said that this process is really about bringing in the people who have time. It's about the people who are going to contribute directly to your project. But you also get some benefits for the people who are time-rich, uh, sorry, cash-rich, because they're going to pay for other people to do stuff. Okay, that's outside of the project, it's outside of the community, but those people, if they know their open source business well, are going to be doing the work inside the community, which is good for us. So Henrik Ingo did a, sur a survey of some, uh, of some high profile uh, open source projects uh, a few years ago. He looked at about 30 commonly accepted as being successful open source projects, and he found that nine of the top 10 projects in terms of um, vibrancy and viability and user base and contribution base uh, and diversity were in foundations. And the, the, the difference between those nine and the tenth, which was a commercially driven uh, open source project, the difference in scale was an order of magnitude. And this says to us that, well, if you focus on building community, which is what foundations are, are about, what you're doing is you're creating a larger potential customer base. And that, of course, is good for any business that is working within the community and generating revenue to pay for the contributors and the developers that are there and to support the volunteer activities that are going on. So the green bar here, it's a, it's a bit small so you can't see it. Sorry, not green, the blue. The blue bar here is the passers-by. And we all know that for the number of people who pass by, a very small number will become users. And for the number of people of users who are the green bar, a very small number will actually become contributors, which is the tiny little slither of orange at the top there. Those people in the, on, in the blue, many of those are cash rich, but time poor. And that's why they never make the transition to being a known user. There's plenty of users of open source that we don't know about, but they're still users. Those people, the ones that are never going to make this progression in between these phases, are still valuable to the community, but they're valuable to people who are running businesses around those communities. So by investing in creating this kind of infrastructure, which is going to attract more passers-by, not only are we benefiting the community directly by bringing in contributions and making it easier for people to develop on the project, but we're also making it better for our employers and, and so on by making the market, the, the potential market, larger. So we're creating this really nice circular solution. Um, we started from the point of making it easier for people to, to come online and uh, evaluate this solution. We're then using uh, free hosting services. And I talked about VM Depot. Of course, Amazon have their equivalent of this. They call them AMIs. Um, free hosting solutions for images for people to be able to quickly fire up and customize either in an evaluation environment or in a production environment. We then moved on to say, well, if we're going to maintain these binary blobs every time, we don't really want to put the overhead of that on the release manager in our open source project, so let's automate it. Oh, and by the way, by automating it, we're actually making it easier for our developers as well as our release managers. That's fantastic. And then a further benefit of, that or benefit, benefit of that automation is that we're also providing the beginnings of the scaffolding for people who want to do, uh, who want to push this into production because they've got these DevOps tools available to them and the configuration files, et cetera, that they need 
to get started in building the configuration for their solution out in production. So we're benefiting every stage, whether it be part of the community development activities or whether it be part of the business development activities. And we're keeping the things healthily separate as well. So in all ways, I believe it's good for the community as a whole to do this all the time. So that was my last slide. We haven't had a lot of discussion during this. It's a big room. Thank you for a few of you coming down to the front. Um, but has anybody got any comments, observations, any enhancements that we could add to this kind of model? So, um, so the question, since there wasn't a mic there, is, is do we find that people tend to use these things in production? Um, or do they tend, you know, do they stop at the evaluation? Is that right? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, it depends on who you are, to be perfectly honest. Um, there's a company called Bitnami who provide these kinds of, um, for us, VM Depot images, but they also do it on Amazon. And they provide stock images of things like Drupal and WordPress and, and LAMP stacks and all sorts of things. And what they find is that um, they have a large number of customers, a significant number of customers. They're driving a lot of, uh, of, of time, uh, compute time on various clouds. Um, and their customers tend to be small companies who want to get up and running quickly, and they've perhaps just got one instance running in the cloud, running a copy of Drupal, et cetera. But as soon as you start going beyond that and you start wanting to do load balancing and you start wanting to configure things, people need to get in at the, at the configuration layer, not just take a binary virtual machine that, that hasn't been optimized for their environment. Now, this idea of, of doing the whole thing through DevOps tooling and putting it into the release management tool chain of an open source project is relatively new. I'm only aware of a couple of projects that are actually doing this at the moment. I would predict that people will start to take those configuration files that the community is using as a starting point for their own production deployments just as you take the open source code as a starting point for your own production deployments within, with, within, uh, uh, within normal, you know, open, the actual program code. Um, will the configurations be right? Will they need to edit them? Well, of course, they'll need to edit them because they'll have a different environment. Some people will want to, to, to distribute it across all of the data centers of the globe. Other people will be saying, no, it's fine just to do North America or Brazil or whatever. Um, so I don't know the answer to the, will they use the Vagrant configuration files, but I imagine they would. Does anybody have any opinion on that? Seems like they'd use something large. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the observation is that, that it seems like they'd use something like Chef, Puppet, Salt, Ansible. And I totally agree. I use the shell scripts here simply because if people don't know Puppet or Chef and, uh, and so on, it, it could be what's going on here, and it's a short session. Um, but I totally agree. For those of you who don't know about Chef and Puppet and the various configuration management tools, um, they are ways of doing what we did in the shell script, but much more intelligently. And they have much more scalable ways of, of, of managing the infrastructure that you would create. And I totally agree. In a real world environment, people should be using those tools, not shell scripts. Oh, you do? Oh, Daniel. Hi, Daniel. <laughs> I'm glad I said nice things about you. <laughs> Was it right what I said? Was it right what I said about Bitnami and that your customers tend to be small? Yeah, so again, you didn't have a mic, so um, the, the, the final point was a really important one. I, th I think that um, I didn't realize you were from Bitnami. Um, I'm glad I didn't say something too stupid. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, Docker is another tool that we, we would probably want to look at using in here. And do what Docker does is provides a, a much lighter weight way of running uh, these kinds of virtual machines. It's actually a much faster 
recycling of, of the machines. There are lots of other benefits as well, and it, it's, it's a great tool. It's not one that I personally have got my hands on and played with at this point. Um, but every time I talk about Vagrant, people go, but what about Docker? So that's coming next, I'm sure. Absolutely. My actual question is a pretty tricky one. Do you see any possibility to do that directly on the client dynamics here? Right, so I, I'm going to repeat what you said first because I think it's really important um, and really ties back to what was said over here about things like Chef and, and Puppet. Um, in a production environment, there's much more than just getting the VM up and running. You need monitoring. You need your various different things going on around it. There's lots of stuff. It's not just running a VM with an application on it. Um, absolutely true, which is why the point was made really in production, you want to use Puppet or Chef, because that provides a way of providing those machines around it and monitoring the configuration of the various machines and making sure it works. Absolutely, I totally agree. But the important thing from the point of view here is where we wrote the Bootstrap SH um, shell script, all you do is write a Puppet um, manifest or a Chef recipe or whatever tool you want to use. And instead of saying boot in the Vagrant file where we said provision using, in this case, we used Shell, we say provision using Puppet. And other than that, it's exactly the same process. Yeah, but the, the yes, okay. So again, it's it's even more complex than I, than I suggested because there is. Uh, so what I was describing there was the use of something like Chef Solo uh, rather than the the, um, the the server Chef Server. Um, and you're right, you need a Chef Server if you're going to go into a full blown production environment. But if you remember. What I said at the beginning was I'm only really talking about bringing in people into the open source community. And you're absolutely right. There's a whole new raft of stuff after that when you start getting into the true ops part of DevOps. This is more the dev part of ops. But you're absolutely right. From an infrastructure point of view, it becomes more complex. But you need this stuff to be able to do the later stuff. So that was my, my point here, that I'm not trying to do the ops end of things. It's more about how do we improve our development processes to bring in more people to the community. And your question was, if I recall correctly, do I see infra, and I presume you're talking about Apache infrastructure, yes. do I see Apache infrastructure team uh, moving towards using, di providing dynamic VMs at so and so on? And I'm, I'm afraid I'm gonna cop out and say I, I, I don't know. It's not up to me. It's up to the VM, it's up to the infrastructure team and the VP infrastructure, et cetera. Um, I will tell you I asked the question, we're going into the budget planning phase at the moment, and I asked the question of the infrastructure team, you know, do you guys want to spend some time over the next year putting infrastructure in place that's going to make your job easier in the future using various DevOps tooling and stuff like that? Um, they're talking about that. I'm assuming you're part of that conversation. Um, what the output of that conversation is, don't know. Ask me in a few months when they've submitted their uh, uh, budget request. Yeah, but it, it, the, the people who make that recommendation to the board, and ultimately it's the board that make the decision, the people who make that recommendation is the infrastructure team. So I don't want to speak for the infrastructure team. Can I sneak a question in here? You uh, can. I'll come back to you in a moment. Right, we're about to run out of time. So how do Apache committers get the free uh, interview? Okay, so there's two ways you can, you can do that. You can ask on any of the Apache lists, the committers, that list, five minutes, thank you. 
Um, if you uh, want to uh, email me, they're in my other jacket, I'll give you a card with my email address on. My, my name is R. Gardler, or my, my alias um, within Apache is R. Gardler, so you can just aim, email me at rgardler.apache.org. You can email Jim sitting at the back there. Yeah, email anybody who knows their way around the foundation, any of the public lists, any of the individuals. You fill in a form, you make a request, and it goes off, gets submitted to somebody somewhere, and eventually you get it back. Um, if you don't have access to that MSDN subscription and you want the trial, then that's more of a sales thing. You want to talk to me personally so that I'm not abusing this stage. You had a question there. Congratulations on your graduation. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I did try to do, um, I, my first attempt to, to, as, as the demo was not Solar. Solar is quite a simple application. My first attempt was uh, Apache Allura, which is the code behind SourceForge. And I picked that one because of a huge number of dependencies and so on, and what looked like a really complete um, set of instructions about how to get it going. And I got almost to the end, and, and then it failed. Um, so even when you've been very diligent about updating your documentation, it's so hard to get it right in a complex environment. Um, and the reason I didn't do Nutch plus Solar, which would have been a more powerful demo, is because I was adding that complexity in and I'd already failed on two others and I was giving up. But if you know the project well, I'm not a committer on any of these projects, so if you know the project well, creating these things is actually quite easy. And we should talk about that because I'm always looking for demos and we're contributors on that project. So if that's what you need, I'm sure we can find the resources to help. And if we do do this stuff with our lingo, then we'll talk to the infrastructure and figure out how best to do it within Apache. Any other questions or observations? Nobody's called me a fool yet. I'm disappointed. Oh, no, don't say that. <laughs> no, I agree. I think it's, a, it's an important thing for us to do. And these tools are mature enough to do it now. Um, they have been for a while, actually. Um, but they're only just beginning to, to, to ramp up and be commonly used, I think. Absolutely, and, and you know, uh, we're at ApacheCon, and I was trying to keep it general, not just about Apache. Um, I haven't really, myself, I haven't considered the kinds of issues that you're bringing up as well. How does it interact with infrastructure, et cetera? But that, I think that is an interesting conversation. I'll be very happy to have co a, a coffee with the Apache people who are interested in this and figure out you know, how, can we, how can we tweak this and make it directly applicable to Apache projects in an easy and scalable way. Okay. Thank you very much for, uh, for participating at the end there.